how's everybody doing? All right then. Um, before I get started here, I just need to preface with a couple of things. Um, I was thinking about how I was going to do this because with this type of a build, you know, and upon the request of those that please show us everything. <laughs> You know, I, obviously I can't show you everything. I mean, I don't, I don't normally drag a GoPro around on my head or a camera on my hip. Because <laughs> it would be so, like, way too distracting, right? Um, so, briefly then, just let me mention about method and momentum for a second before I, I take you into this. Because this is going to be a bit of a lengthy series, obviously. We want to document... Uh, you know, this barge slip, you know, model, because, you know, it is a feature uh, and prominent piece on the layout. So, you know, um, there might be methods and techniques in here that people can glean from, and there might be some, eh, you know, whatever, right? But you can't please everybody all the time, but I want to try to serve all my subscribers and the associated community fully if I can, you know, and, and touch on all these aspects. So what I'll do is, is I'll just do the, the basic commentary first in uh, each episode, and then I'll add at the end the tutorial, like little clips edited in, because it's quite a bit of work to do all the editing part. And in terms of momentum, like doing the production really cuts in on my, my momentum. And what I mean by that is, 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 um, you know, there's no rush, I get that, but because I was trained in film and theater and so on, I can't help uh, getting into this sort of momentum where, you know, you just really go, like you really move, and uh, like in terms of production, because in film, it, the economy was based on time, not money, because there's loads of money, but not much time, so, you know, they would give you a big project like this and say, okay, and you get all excited about it, no, oh, I'll build this, I'll build that, and then they say, like they drop the bomb on you, they go, and we need it in two weeks, you know, <laughs> but I'm not going to finish this in two weeks, but um, it's coming right along. And in the past couple of weeks, as you know, there was a heat wave. So it took a little bit of my momentum away, but now I've got a lot of it back. Now I'm getting back into the flow. And as you can see, I've got a pretty much a, a foundation for the barge slip here in terms of the main structure. You know, I'm building it Paul Mallory style. So for those of you that don't know who Paul Mallory is, uh, I'll just show you a clip of his book. And, you know, some would consider him to be old school, but, you know, these were the pioneers and the masters of the hobby. And uh, they understood that road bed, track bed was all part of the structure, regardless of whether it was a bridge or just a right of way or a piece of tangent or, you know, whatever, right? So it's very important that the track stability, like your track period is perfect. Like you put a lot of energy into the track, even in this case with the barge stuff, I don't want, you know, three pieces of a model, let's say, you know, all sort of interconnected. And not lining up and, and, and going bumpity bump, right? So you can see it's one slab. I'll jump off the tripod here in a second. Um, it's one big slab of 3 8 7 ply birch plywood. And I'm running uh, a maple spline down the center of it. And for obvious reasons, for warpage, right? Because especially in the Pacific Northwest, the, the humidity is just killer. I mean, you can use the best plywood in the world and it's still going to warp if you don't stabilize it and, and build it out, you know. So I've used a combination of the best plywood I could get for 3 8 I'm going to use for roadbed on the whole layout. And then, although this track surface here is just quarter inch. But it's all, you know, framed up underneath, so I didn't need that because I don't need to make long spans. And then you'll see, like, these, uh, like, the concrete abutments and blocks and all this. I'll explain later at the end. It's kind of interesting how I did all that. It's all solid maple, right? Like these uh, stringers here, or joists, if you want to call them, underneath uh, is all solid maple. The uh, blocks are maple. The dowels are type of poplar, I guess. And... So it's a pretty solid structure. 
and it'll all be dressed in this, you know, evergreen styrene plastic. I just see that as it goes along, uh, you know, and and I want to build this like this particular approach and ramp because the barge would be over here, which is off scene, right? Uh, I want to build it as one separate model, and then it's going to be uh, screwed with a couple of screws into the block of the abutment here, and then one somewhere here, and then possibly at the front. So four uh, pick points for screws just to suck it down tight, because the way the pot, the pilings are done, uh, there's a little bit of a little tiny bit of run up, but it'll all suck down tight and flush when it's screwed in place. So it was designed that way, because you're always going to have a bit of a run out when you have a long span like that it can't be perfect unless you actually physically mount it or screw it to the surface and pull it down tight right and then i want to be able to paint it as well so that's why i'm doing it this way i know there's other methods this is not the only method too right this is just boomer's way of doing it you know or the old way or whatever like i don't even i, I mean there's even modelers now that you know want to build this way too and there's a reason for it, right? And I can take this model now and just lift it off and put it on another piece of plywood on a Lazy Susan and kind of spin it around and work on it when I start dressing it. Like when I do all the plate girder work and the deck and the railings and all this detail up here, you know, by the hydraulic gates and, you know, and then this, this here ramp is really cool. And there's these little... Uh, sort of kiosk type um, platforms that are mounted onto this uh, articulating ramp that go up and down that, that are fixed to it that you know with ladders going like this is a really cool model but so I want a good foundation right we need good foundations for the things we build in life you know including our models you know I'm an advocate of that so and with the maple as I'll describe uh, near the end for the tutorial, like you'll see why I do that. I'll explain to you why I do that, okay? Okay, so um, let me just jump off the uh, pedestal here for a minute and I'll just show you, uh, just take you a little bit closer pan, okay? Around. Alrighty. So you can see there's the wooden uh, larger pilings. Uh, those are where the barge slips into. Right? There's actually the barge slip right here, right? And then there's these hydraulic pads that come out, you know, to, to, to line it up to the end of the ramp here. And then there's a whole series of those that run, but obviously they'll run off the layout. And then this gets cut to profile later when I do the backtrack with the warehouses and so on. And then you can see here, right, there's a spline underneath there, maple spline. You see the concrete blocks and sort of the pilings there. Well, you can't really see them because of the shadow, but but they'll be prominent enough. But that's the tide level that I've chosen to go with. That's pretty, uh, a fairly apparent, I would say, in most of the photos I have, which keeps the ramp level, see? So depending on the tide, this ramp would be, you know, down or up. You know, and I don't want to be pushing cars up and down and having them roll off and, you know, that kind of trouble. So it's going to be modeled totally level. So that's what the tide dictates. I might have cheated a bit because I want to still see the pilings. You know what I mean? So, and then you can see here there's a bit of a scarf here in the 3 8 plywood again. You know, like I did the backdrop and other, and, and this seam here, it was scarfed. So this block, there's another plate underneath the layout here. Well, it, where I can run two bolts, like I'll just machine, like maple's good, you can machine it with a, like you can thread it, you know, so I'll be able to suck that block down tight, and then, uh, you know, suck down the center piece tight, and it'll be nice and level, and I can remove it, right, until I join, you know, the next run here, which will be another piece, right, you know, that'll run, uh, over to here okay all right so that's the uh, overview then on the barge slip so far okay so enjoy the tutorial for those of you that want to learn that part of it and that'll be a little bit ongoing over several episodes of the SRY Anasis Island barge slip build
Okay, so uh, I just want to show you this part with the jig that I'm building for building the uh, two hydraulic gates on each side of the front of the ramp. Okay, and what I'm going to use for the risers, like for the concrete columns, um, is I'm going to use this number two, three, four, seven, sixteenth tube. I chose this over half inch, which was a little bit larger, and three eighths was a little bit smaller than this. So this is the one that I feel is the best choice for this. So that's seven sixteenth tube. And then what I'm going to do is, is I took uh, some of this wooden dowel here, which is three eighths. Okay. And I cut uh, eight pieces. It doesn't matter, like these are just going to be stands to hold this tube up and the jig. So, like in this case, these particular um, dowels are like around two inches. So, I just rough cut eight and then I tape them together and just push them in, in into the disc sander and get them square, right? And flip them around. Gently do the other side, just, just so that they're all square. All right, and then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use some five minute epoxy and I'm going to glue uh, one in the center of each one of these circles. You can drill these out and insert them if you want, but this is just going to be a jig just to build the models on, so it's no biggie. So, and then you can see that this 716 slips right over top of this 3 8 tube, nice, eh? So that'll hold them up, right? When I when I build each one as a model, see there's two of them. So I'm going to build them up uh, this way. And then just slip them right off the jig and put them right onto the model. Okay, so I know this seems simple, but you know what? I miss simple all the time. You know, that's just the way it is. So, but I'll just share this. Like, how do I cap the end of these columns? These, these tube-shaped uh, circular columns, you know, for the gates. So, you just take some scrap, right? You save all your scrap from your evergreen. In this case, this is 40 thou. So, I want a little bit of thickness there to drill into, to add stuff if I need to. You don't want to go too thin, because then if you too much cement which is good sometimes to get a good weld, might ripple the top of it. But so 40 thou. So you just take a piece of scrap 40 thou like that and just put a little flood spot on there like this. You know, don't be afraid to uh, use a fair bit to get just a pool on there. And then just take the end of the tube and just press it down so that the plastic microscopically you'll see mushrooms out and it creates a little weld, you know, okay. Okay, so now that these have been glued on, right, we've capped the end of these, right? All I do is just put a slice in with a knife like that, snap it off. All right. Same goes with all of them, just, just a random, it's just scrap, right? And then you just take a pair of nippers. Just nip it away until you get it like this. Okay. Just nibble it around, get it round. And then I, I have a bunch of these I make up on a piece of plywood I glue sandpaper to. And I just sand them all down. They sand down quick and you just clean them all up so they look like this. And there's a nice capped steel column, right? You can build on top of that. And these will go on this jig here, four of each. And then I'll put the I-beams across. It'll hold them nice in place. I can line them up nice. I'll have a nice stable platform to model both hydraulic gates. The whole assembly is right on this plate here. And I can move it around. And, you know, and then just slide the whole model right off together as one, right? And then put it on the model in the layout. Okay? Okay, so I just want to show you something about spacing and getting, you know, these, you know, these two gates, right, all have to be symmetrical in terms of braces and so on. 
So how do I get them all exact? All right, like this here. Like, see these cross beams right here? There's one here. There's one there. They go around the whole, every pole on both sides. So I'm building two models, right? Two towers I'm building. So how do I get the lines straight across? Well, here, look. You make a couple spacers. This is half, oops, sorry. Uh, this is half an inch, and it slips right over the 7 sixteenths. Right? Okay. So I just slide that collar on there, and then, I, and then I can make a pencil line on every one of these poles. Okay? With this spacer. Flat down on the jig, on the surface of this jig, see? And I just move it to the next one. Draw a line, and then I'll get a consistent line exact the same on all four poles. Totally uh, square as well. Here's from another angle. So here's my spacer on my pole on these concrete riser columns for the gates, right? So I want to mark off. I need consistent marking glue points or drill points for all my bracing, right? So I put this little collar here. I just slip it over top. I put the pencil there and I just turn it. Right, I turn it on the wooden dowel on the jig, right, just like that. There's the line. Slide it over the next one. Right, there's the line. Okay. Now I need another line up here. Well, I've already measured it with this tube. So I slide that over turn, do all eight like this, right? Nice and quick, eh? And totally square too. And, and consistent. Exact height and square on the pole. Okay? With a couple of spacers. That's how you do it, right? That's the reason for, put, for building this, these on a jig like this. If you build piers or other bridges, you can do the same thing. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time to build the jig, but boy, will you ever be glad you did when you start to build the model. Okay, so how do I determine these glue points here? Like, how do I keep them all square? Like, how do I know on the cylinder where they're going to be? So we have our two heights, right, for the lower beam and the upper beam, right, don't we? right with the spacers that I showed you so now I need marks that are you know I need four well actually two because I need to run beams this way and I need to run beams this way well how do I know exactly where to mark it on or to glue it to okay so see the grid that's already drafted on this jig plate here there's see all these dowels are on a center line aren't they I just drew up a square simple pattern like once I decided the spacing of the poles right once that was determined and then I glued I epoxied these dowels right that are square from a disc sander like I showed with the jig they're glued on there with five minute epoxy and they're nice and solid they're not going anywhere trust me they, and they don't need to be pinned or I mean you can do this on a drill press as well a nice square drill press and get these pegs but they're still not going to be perfect, right? So if you just glue them to the surface here, you'll still be able to, you know, crack them off like that if it's not straight or just reattach them with CA. That's what I find works best. If they're drilled and, and glued into the plate, then you're not moving them if they're not straight, okay? So this one can easily be reattached, all right? Now, how do I get the marks on, e on the upper line and the lower line for the glue points for the braces? Well, first of all, we just hold this, this tube in place, and then we line up a square right here, right, to this line. It doesn't matter if it's on the inside, because you can spin this tube, right? So we just draw a line up through both the upper and lower like that. See? Now I want one exactly at a 45 on the other side. Or 25% on the circumference. So I just turn, turn this line so it lines up right here. See? You got my drift. 
you hold that in place, line up your square like so, and then I just turn it inside like that. There's a, a point there where I can glue to this post. I do the same with the others, and then the other line's right here that runs down this line, see? So you just got to, so it's like a 3D grid, right? That's basically what you do. That's the whole point of a jig, right? So you can build everything square. Okay, continuing on here then. Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, you can use whatever jig style, magnetized, metal plate, whatever system you build your model on is fine. I do it this way. This is the way... Now you'll find that when you get hooked on a certain developed uh, tool system or method that you just stick with it. You know, you don't need to change just because something new comes out. Anyway, so with these gate pilings here, um, let me just say something about Evergreen first. Because, I mean, there are many of you that probably know about this product, right? Like in this case here, what I'm using is this I-Beam number 278. I just want to say about Evergreen models a couple of things. Number one, they produce uh, practically every single engineered steel profile in the Western world, if I can phrase it that way. So every shape or, you know, uh, everything that's built like this is, can all be done with Evergreen plastic. This is just, could be 40 thou sheet, 80 thou sheet. You know, the strips here, they have pre-cut. You can cut them yourself. All the tubing, the all the lumber sizes, steel sizes, dowels. I mean, it, it, it's all there. I mean, it's all really simple shapes when you think about it. It's just the combination of the whole that makes up these beautiful engineered, you know, wonders of the Western world, as you might say. Um, you know, like in any form, right? And number two is, yes, it's expensive, this stuff. Like, here's one I've had for ages, like from Grand Prix Hobbies. And that was the hobby shop I grew up as a kid. I mean, I didn't buy it then, but you know, there's $2.99 there. And then, of course, you know, $4.95, you see inflation. But it is a bit expensive if you go out and just buy a whole bunch of it. But you don't buy it all at once. You just buy it as you need it. And you just keep adding. Like, I have a whole box like my favorite box, like if I could keep one box of stuff for models would be all my evergreen plastic supplies. Because I can build any model from it. I can't from a prefab kit, right? So, yeah, so every time I go to the hobby shop, like RC Pit Stop, one of my favorite local hobby stores, um, I pick up a, a package. Like, you know, just the other day I did a run, see? Picked up, uh, you know, some right angle, some HL scale 4x10. And you just build up your kit that way over time. And then when you go to build a model, you can reach over, and there it is, right? You're not, oh, geez, i got to make a run. I don't want to run for five bucks. You know, so build it up, and then it's on hand, right? Okay. So when you're gluing styrene plastic together, I want to talk about adhesive for a second. I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again, but I won't bring it up again further on in this build. Do not use super glue for styrene plastic. Look, I know there's exceptions where you want to glue, glue brass or metal or wood to plastic. Then it's okay, right? Um, but, like, the solvent itself, like... This solvent here, right, it's like water thin, like it'll capillary, you just hold two pieces together and it'll just run a seam, it'll run down the seam and, and it'll actually weld the plastic. So when you go to sand a seam, let's say, you're going to get 
plastic on plastic, right? The the solvent evaporates, so you get a nice clean seam, especially when you're kit bashing or if you want to merge a sheet into a cur you know, whatever, right? If you use CA, it's a whole different property. It'll leave a big lump, like I'm talking microscopically here, like leave a big lump, and every time you sand it, it'll push down the CA hardness into the plastic, and it'll just spring back as you're taking away the outside edges of the plastic. You'll never get a good seam. CA is, 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 uh, is a mechanical bond. It's not a chemical bond. This is a chemical bond made for this kind of plastic. This is what you should use. And I don't have shares in Plastruct, but it's, but it's the recommended cement. Like I buy three or four bottles every time I go to the store because I just, well, you, if you leave the cap off, it'll evaporate. So watch out for that. Keep it in a mug so you don't knock it over because you only do that once. Um, and furthermore, you can just hold two pieces of plastic together and run a bead down. It'll, it'll run on its own like water goes everywhere and it'll just fuse the plastic together. And you can actually work with it like five, ten seconds later. It actually tacks up really fast, right? The problem with CA, you know, it has the tensile, right? Like if you glued your two pieces together like this, you tried to pull apart, like it's not going to. That's why the old commercial of the guy hanging from a helmet from the ceiling, you know, oh, look at the. But if you just push the guy and like shear, the snap right off, right? But that won't happen with this. If you weld two pieces together, like really weld them so you put a good amount in, like you get a feel for this stuff and yet it mushrooms out a bit like a weld. If you go like this, like it won't break. A lot of times it'll it'll just start bending the other part of the plastic. It might break there, but I've had it break off elsewhere. If there's a nick in the plastic or whatever. And if you try to pull it apart this way, it won't come apart either, right? So, you know, weld your plastic together. Use the proper adhesive. CA is good. I keep it in my kit, see? But it's more for, um, like, if you want to tack something up, uh, you know, for example, uh, if I want to glue a piece of brass rod to a piece of wood or plastic, or let's just say I want to glue a, a panel down, a large panel, and I want to put glue everywhere, I'll put a couple spots of CA and push the panel down and then run a bead, a capillary of solvent around it, and she's good, right? You don't need to cover the whole surface with glue, right? So learn... Like, read an article on the glues and understand why they are what they are. And use the, the correct adhesive when you model. Especially with this plastic, like, it'll be bulletproof almost. Okay, like super solid model. So when you bang it and knock it, and it'll happen, you, know, you don't bust it off. CA will just snap, right? And just in closing on that, like, any good museum that's actually legitimate, and if you're a model maker or a builder they actually prohibit ca to be used for anything on a model because it ages after a couple of years and cracks and breaks i mean you can use it for anchoring if something's already doweled let's say or pinned or whatever you can use a ca to hold the pin in place that actually holds the part together that kind of thing anyway that's the correct doctrine for you know ca versus plastic struck when you're using plastic okay Okay, so as per the photograph in my drawing, as you can see here, we have our four upright columns. They've been capped. I built the platform base up with I-beam, right? Okay. A couple things I got to do now. What about these little gaps right here? Like on the prototype, that would have ran all the way through. They would have cut that steel. That's a kind of a cumbersome task for a scale model like this. So... What I've elected to do here is to just take some 109, again, evergreen. There's always a matching piece. If you just study those racks that you see in your hobby stores, there's a reason for all that stuff, right? So in this case, it's 10 thou, nice and thin, and then by 250. And it fits perfectly in here, see? So I'm just going to cut a strip, and I'm going to slide it in tight like that, see? And just mark it there and cut it and just glue it in, and that'll clean that up nice and it won't matter on the inside because it's going to be covered anyway now also for the top of this you can see right here there's a 
angle, right angle frame that, that skirts all around the whole top of this platform where the railings are welded to. These upright rod, which in this case would be probably 30 thou evergreen. So I want to build that in. And so you can use either 291 or 292. Like I'm not going to get, you know, overly, you know, perfectionistic about the exact scale size in this case, because these ones are both pretty close. Like this one's two mil, this one's 1.5. And I'm going to choose to go with the smaller one. I find that the one on the right there, 292, is a bit too fat. And I always like to go to the small side of ratio because it just ends up looking better on the model if it's fine scale that you're after. So that, that'll get framed on top like that. You can 45 the end of these or you can even just butt them up either. Like you probably won't notice it. Uh, it's probably a dis design decision. Maybe the prototypes like that. I can't tell because I don't, I don't have photographs that actually show that close. But that's what I'll go with. Okay. Okay, so before I continue on with this build, I just want to recommend to those of you that are attempting this or doing this, or maybe you have your own method, but I always make a bunch of sanding sticks up, right? Because they're important. Like, in, you know, it's some different sizes, just from some cut plywood or wood. Just make sure it's straight. Like in this case, I use scrap 7 ply 3 8 because it won't warp, right? it stays straight. And I put 220 and 180 are the two grits I use. And, you know, like you really need it for, you know, like little board sanders. It really comes in handy. Okay. Okay, so before I show you about capping the side of these I-beams, these air pockets right here, these spaces, and then the right angle, uh, we just need to sheet the top of this. And what I'm going to use is... 20 thou plane, number 9020, 20 thou thick plane, right, sheet. This stuff goes a long ways. I think there's three sheets in here, so you can, you just scribe your piece like that and just snap. That's it. Lay one on there. And one on there, like that. Okay. And then I'll lay my right angle on top of that. Start building it out. Already, when that's tacked on, man, this thing is solid. Whew, it's just really becomes a solid structure. It's a lot of fun, too, building like this. It's like you're building the real prototype, but in scale, right? Okay, so now that the top deck is plated with 20 thou, um, which I elected to cap first. I mean, it will make this edge a little bit thicker here, but I'm okay with that. I'm not going to cut a piece in and I'm not going to go to all that trouble. You know, I'm not competing here. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's uh, enough's enough already on that one. Um, so just for most of you that uh, are probably already know this, but uh, make sure you get a ruler uh, with the standard, if you like. You know, I still like standard. You imagine that, a Canadian that just will not cross over to millimeters. But you have to, right? Because the metric is way more accurate uh, when you're building in small scale like this. The standard just doesn't cut it, I'm afraid. Uh, not in this scale. So you need the smaller increments. So, so I just basically cut like the right angle now that I'm going to lay on here. Um, just for the quick refresh, right? There's a right angle that goes all that frames the top of this platform. Anyway. So, if your jig is square, then when you line up off of that right angle, you can see here that it's pretty much the same right across, see? And there's going to be a little bit of play. But that's okay, because you need that there, right? A little bit of run out and play just to square things up with. So I like to cut these pieces like oversize. Like don't go to all the trouble to cut it to fit exactly to this width. Because you'll be, because you'll run out. You'll you'll glue it more to this way and it'll be short. Just, just cut it larger. 
You know what I mean? Like cut it larger than the actual piece. You know, I've talked about this and stressed it over and over again. And then once it's set up, you can just come back and just clip the end off. Okay, and it'll be nice and flush. Okay. Okay, so um, the concrete slabs or blocks. One, two, three, four, and then there's five, which I've also cut all out of maple. Like I wasn't sure how I was going to do these, like like these pilings too, or. Um, I just used wooden dowels and then I'm just going to slip these into a jig that I have to flat boards on them and then I'll just epoxy them down onto the surface. I was going to drill but I thought ah I don't like to drill holes and things if I don't have to and in terms of maple um, maple's a really nice wood because it's just almost grainless you know and uh, if it's painted and just sanded lightly it just looks really good you can even put a bit of uh Texture paste thin down or to give it a little bit of a concrete texture And then like these blocks here like they have a pretty distinct bevel on them see on the corners here So what I've done is is I just take the square and Just make about a 1 16th line like this On each side of the corner And then I take my little mini razor plane, it's by Stanley. And then I just want to chamfer that down a bit. It only takes like half a dozen passes or so and you get a nice, uh, you know, a nice chamfer there. And then I'll just touch these on the disc center and it'll polish them up or burn them almost even too. So they'll just be no, like the grain, like won't be any end grain really. So uh, they should look pretty good, right? For these. And I'll show you the center one as well. See, here's the center uh, block. Uh, this, uh, this side here. <coughs> The steel girder sits in there like that. The approach and then the actual ramp, you know, this section up here sits on this side. All right, and there's a pivot, so it goes up and down like that. This is this is all made of maple too. I like to use maple quite a bit. I've used maple a lot with model parts, actually, especially in the film industry too. It's just great because you can cut it on the table saw you know you can see there the bearing on my saw is getting a little bit tired now so it you know wanders a bit that's really why you get the burn mark there but it's a really nice blade I have the saws not the greatest but the blades really nice it's a uh, glue joint rip blade glue joint meaning like it, it has a little round tooth like the tooth on the glue joint it's kind of interesting instead of it being like a wedge shape like that it's actually sort of rounded on the top. And so it just rips, it's like just for ripping. I know it's troublesome to change the saw blade on your saw, but you know, you have to if you want nice, clean. Like this is so smooth. I haven't even sanded this. And if you paint this, like you can't, you can make this look like metal, wood, if you want to wood grain it or plastic or anything, right? It's good old maple, right? And it's solid and it won't move, you know, so. I, I I find it it's really good for concrete abutments. It's excellent stuff, and um, yeah, so that's what I chose to do. These uh, concrete slabs, and then this is just a hardwood dowel. I don't even know if it's poplar or something, or uh, sometimes I use oak. But I just cut these a little bit proud, and I drilled these on the drill press, just halfway into the block here. It's a dab of white glue, so it's pretty solid, right? And then what I'll do is, is I'll just set this up on a jig I have, and I'll just 
board sand these. Uh, they're only out a few millimeters, so they got to match, um, you know, the seat of the approach abutment when they're sitting. Um, they need to be flush. Okay, so I got my concrete bridge supports here, and I made them out of maple. Okay, I like to make a lot, as much as I can, actually, out of hardwood because I just love working with wood. And when you, when the majority of your substrate on your layout is wood, everything glues up nice, right? So anyway, I made these four concrete bridge abutments here, or supports out of maple, like I did the other ones. Okay, I really like maple. It's solid wood. It doesn't move, and it's just beautiful wood to actually build models out of. And uh, anyway, so I took five sixteenths dowels. I jigged all these up together, right? Put them on the drill press and drilled them out to about half inch deep. And then I glued these up. These dowels. They were all a bit proud. It doesn't matter how rough they are on the end, right? Because you're going to cut them back anyway. So what I do here now is I take this little spacer so it's flush on the bottom here and it's so the dowels sort of sit on there like they're stabilized so when the blade comes through the like the vibration the chatter like it won't blow these apart see so what you do is, is you take your push stick and you just push this spacer up ahead like that and you just run this right through like that okay that's all you do and there look at that like there might be a little tiny bit of splintering with theres it doesn't matter because they're going to be pilings in the water right and then they just sit there nice and flush and you just do all four like that so when you go to lay your your steel girders across it's just beautiful perfect level okay okay so here they are see see how flush they are they're perfect they're the perfect height well, I mean, not, not perfect height, sorry, perfect flush, I mean. Uh, the heights, well, the heights, I mean, it determines the height of the bridge, but I still have to build the girder out. And then, um, you know, I'll show you the top plate, like the core roadbed that goes on. But see how the pilings are? And even if they are a bit rough, like, you're not going to be able to know anywhere if, if you splinter a few of them. But these all turned out really good, actually. So, so. Anyway, maple, good old maple for model parts, works great. So this is the ramp block here. Eh? See this block right here? This is the center. It's pretty heavy duty. Uh, you know, there's uh, dual pilings like this. One, two, one, two. And there's a big slab that goes right up through and the the ramp is pivots on one end and the the main approach girder comes in here. So I cut it out of maple. I think I mentioned that before. Like see the profile there? The maple, right? Um so this wood here is just I love this maple for uh, like if you have a sharp drill, sharp tools. Maple's just beautiful for building models with. It's so solid and just smooth. Takes paint well. You can see the bearing like in my saw is not the best anymore. It's been a hard time on it, but the blade I use is really good. If you're gonna uh, buy tool or like if you're gonna get a table saw. Like you don't need to spend, like don't get the cheapest table saw, but you don't need to get a big shop saw either. Like get a good contractor saw and it'll last you a long time. And uh, if you put a good blade on it, like not the blade that it comes with, but a good Freud combination blade that's good at ripping and cross cutting. I mean, look at that. It's just like there's no um, splitting or nothing, right? It cuts like a laser, man. That's a saw blade and this I, or, yeah, that's a saw blade and then this I just did with a plane. Maple plane is really nice too, like I say if you have a sharp plane. So that's going to be really nice and then the uh, road bed, the 3 8 and the cork is going to sit here, right? It's going to be flush to here and it's going to sit through here. So I want to try to build this whole model. I'll put these pilings in and I'll show you how I did the other ones. But Okay, so here's a technique on how you get all the pilings even flush, all of them once they're glued into the block. 
and in this case is a model of concrete block. You want it to sit flush on the water surface. Okay, so when this one's got dual, so see how I put spacers in here? Just cut from scrap maple on the bottom here just to help absorb the vibration so you don't splinter all these dowels. And then we have a, a spacer block here for this form to sit on, see? Okay, so we just put it in like that and we use a push stick. And we just push it through like this. Okay. 